Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays, you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. 
back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. S spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. At number five, sucking toes. The British royal family are considered celebrities. I mean, with the amount of time people spend obsessing about their every move, I'd say that they're 10 times more famous than the Kardashians. They don't need their own reality show for people to keep up with them. People just do it. With this obsession with the royals obviously comes paparazzi trying to get the latest scoop on members of the family and what they do in their spare time, as well as who they're canoodling with. This was how Sarah Ferguson was exposed for seeing other men shortly after she and Prince Andrew separated. Sarah was photographed topless on a beach with a man named John Bryan, and it could have just been a juicy story by itself, but things got weird when pictures were published showing the man sucking on Sarah's toes. This again wasn't a good look for the royals, and the queen was pretty mad about the whole situation, but I'd like to look at the bright side of this. Think that this John Bryan guy had a pretty good time throughout all this. I mean, he got to suck royal toes and be published in the newspaper. Sounds like a pretty lit time for him. Number four, party time. British royals are people of high esteem, morals, and cut from a higher quality of cloth. So when members of the royal family are seen partying too hard, well, it's a bad look. Prince George, Duke of Kent, was one such royal. He became known for spending his evenings in the best hotels and ballrooms that money could buy, even sometimes wandering into venues that were a tad tawdry, even by today's standards. What's more interesting than that is the prince living the life of a frat boy is that his promiscuous relationship with not only just women, but men as well. Add in substance abuse issues that would make Charlie Sheen blush, and you've got yourself one wild prince. Yet again, there's some private letters that seem to support such wild accusations. Unfortunately, he passed away in a plane crash that is shrouded in mystery, and the royal family is suspected of having a hand. Foreshadowing much? At number three, the milkman's son. By far the most scandalous royal relationship of modern times was without a doubt Prince Charles and Princess Diana's marriage. We all know how messy their relationship was with the love triangle, the affairs, and Diana's confessions of how tough it was to be married to Charles. But one of the other pretty juicy secret scandals that surrounded the couple was the speculation that the couple's youngest son, Prince Harry, wasn't even Prince Charles's biological kid. In a tell-all interview with Princess Diana in 1995, she admitted to having had a five-year long affair with a military man named James Hewitt. After Diana's passing, people started speculating that perhaps this James character was actually Harry's biological dad. I mean, when you take a side-by-side -side look at James and Harry, their resemblance is pretty uncanny. James denied all allegations, and the royal family did the same, but this still remains one of those royal secrets that I'm sure everyone believes, but just won't admit. Number two, step bro? Yeah, I know it's gross, but the truth of the matter is, none of us would be here if it wasn't for a little inbreeding. Royals just tend to turn that dial up to 11. Back in ye olde times, bloodlines had to be maintained, and the only way to keep them pure was to marry cousins and have children. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip are both related to Queen Victoria, but the crazy bus doesn't stop here. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were first cousins, and they had nine children together. This is a tradition that all royal families practice. Of course, marriage back then was more of a business decision or a political one. It's why certain distant cousins end up ruling different monarchies and empires. Sure, I get it. Why cross the street when you can cross the hall? But at some point, you gotta run out of cousins. Let's just be glad this practice is of the past and stays in the past. At number one, long lost family. The royal family is known for trying to make themselves look perfect in the eyes of the public. They are always trying to look poised and put together and without flaws, but this effort also comes with its dark side and there's a dark royal secret that just shows the lengths that they have gone to to make people think that they are all just perfect people of society. It turns out that the queen had secret cousins that very few people knew about. The royal family and everyone adjacent are very well known people, so how did we not know about the Queen's cousins? Well, that's because they were essentially shunned and shipped off elsewhere because of their mental states. Back in the 1940s, mental disabilities were not very understood and were often seen as embarrassing for the families of the people who had whatever disability. The royal family thought that these cousins, Nerissa and Catherine, were too embarrassing for the royal family to keep around, so they had them incarcerated in a mental institution and they remained there for the rest of their lives, cut off from the rest of the royal family. It is said that no member members of the family ever came to visit them. Now that is not a way to treat family. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
Wiper, no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy at a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers were responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, Dormad toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven. Shards and Sharts. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four and honestly, I can do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my God. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. 
Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll... Mm. There you go. Number five is some hair raising standards. As you can probably guess from looking at the statues and other works of art they left behind, the ancient Greeks weren't a big fan of bodily hair. For them, the ideal body, especially for women, was smooth like a dolphin all over. Naturally, in a time before Gillette razors and Shea Butter Shave Cream, twas not that simple. Since they didn't have modern waxing solutions or even razors, despite making the strigil, which if they had sharpened even a little, could have been made for the perfect razor slash hedge trimmer. So the simplest way of achieving the beauty ideal was to simply pluck out individual hairs one by one. A painful, not to mention time consuming process for your legs alone. Imagine trying to do that around back when mirrors haven't been invented yet. Fancy a swifter solution? Well, how about burning all your body hair off? Also the custom in ancient Greece. Best part of that, a lot like today, is if you don't keep up with the societal expectation of shaving, you'd receive a lot of disapproval and discomfort from others. But unlike today, as stated, it was a lot harder for them to shave, so the fact that expectation was there there is insane. This is all about the power balance of the sexes, however, as respectable women's ritualistic deletion of her natural state attests to the male supremacy over his objectified wife. While he has his manhood intact, she must deplete her womanhood and thus alter her innate form so as to uphold the classical ideal. Somehow that didn't apply to eyebrows though. No, no, no. Those had to be like full Frida Kalho experience. The Greeks wanted their ladies' eyebrows to look like a push broom on their damn forehead. In case you ain't picking up what I'm putting down Unibrows were all the rage. Even if you couldn't get to grow one, you could always draw some in. Number four is the bush, the, a favorite of the 70s and of ancient times. Historically, ancient Greek men have had an absolutely fascinating relationship with their down there hair and how they cultivate it. The styles of trimming and manscaping changing per centuries in the overtures of cultural change. In the classic period, the trimming and even shaping, yes, shapes like a heart or a sparkle or a loaf of bread, I don't know, I'm just spitballing, were done on a men's down there. Naturally, this was easiest and most elaborately done by aristocrats. While the poor and common men did more basic triangles or squares or whatever you can do, I don't know. Anyways, by modifying his natural state down there, a man can remove himself from the realm of ordinary man. I mean, think about it. Natural down there growth equalizes every man post P, but the aristocrat elevates himself with this shaven distinction, idealizing its subject as a man more sophisticated than one who possesses unruly and uncontrollable tough. However, during the Tyrannicides revolt, Greek artisans started repping the ah natural in challenge to this. In general, the artistic representation of pubic hair became more naturalistic, abandoning the archaic array of wildly shaven flourishes for simpler and subtler trim jobs. The Greek state began to show that it valued the average citizen with both its institution of democracy and by extension, its more naturalized rendering of down their hair. The increasingly liberated down their hair on the mid fifth century masculine sculptures exemplifies this development. The ancient Greeks continued to fly fluctuate through down their hairstyles afterwards, and their paper trail, or perhaps hair trail, isn't subtle either. Sculptors throughout centuries mark these changes, as does scholarly works such as Asterophon's Listatria. Number three is teeth cleaners. Gotta get your chomper squeaky clean somehow. And back in ancient Greece, you had a few options. First off, powders would be made as toothpaste, and these would be substances like lum, ashes, clay, peppermint, propolis, fennel seeds, cardamom seeds, and a magic substance called mastic. Mastic is also a resin that's a strong antiseptic. They also added abrasives like sand and crushed bones. These powders would be applied to a thin, dampened cloth, string, or twigs, all of which would be then used to rub, buff, and shine in between and on the teeth. By the time of the Roman Empire, the elites had actual servants whose job it was to clean others' teeth and you could visit them and pay for a wash job. Now to address the whole urine mouthwash thing, we've all heard about it at some point. It's true, but it's not. It's not like the Greeks were gargling the early morning dark yellow. They were adding derived properties from urine to their toothpaste. So that brings us to number two, which is the uses of urine. Similar to how you can harvest salt from water, you can collect important acidic properties from processing urine. This is still awful and gross but only because in modern times we're a lot more squeamish to concepts like that. In fact, people back then weren't even unaware that it was kind of crazy. The poet Catalyst once mocked his clean tooth enemy, Agnetius, who to quote him, has shiny white teeth and grins forever everywhere. If he is in court when 
the council excites tears, he grins. If he be at a funeral pyre where one mourns a son devoted, where bereft mother's tears stream for her only son, he grins, whatever it may be, wherever he is, whatever may happen, he grins. And he curses him out by saying to him that the higher the polish on your teeth, the more it proclaims that you have drank your piss. The Roman Emperor Vaspian famously instated a urine tax by taxing the public bins where people dumped urine collected from toilets. The tax was so lucrative that it was continued by his successor Titus. The collected pee was then sold as an ingredient to businesses, workshops, and tanneries, which subsequently were taxed for it. These businesses used it for tanning leather, producing soaps, refining tooth products, making medicine, making elixirs, and more. Ammonia, urine's key ingredients, was used by launderers to get stains out of clothes, and even farmers used it as fertilizer to grow the perfectly acidic fruits. Number one is Aunt Flo. It's been determined that there's a good possibility that women back then had fewer periods and lighter bleeding in ancient Greece than we do now in modern times, just because of diet, climate, and biological changes over history. But weirdly, the expectation was that they would actually bleed very heavily and regularly, and if they didn't, then remedies needed to be used to bring out the blood. Aristotle mentions menstruation being like the flow of blood from a sacrificial animal that must be maintained. As for stopping the flow once it started, the ancient Greeks took after the Egyptians, using a small wooden splint as the tampon base, then wrapping wools and linens around it before cramming it on in. Reusable pads were also made of layering cottons and wools that can be easily separated and washed later. Just remember not to wear any white in the hot Mediterranean sun while you're quite literally on the rag. Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross. It just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It was pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, a little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a sh Brahman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This things that be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good, I like this. I like punching in on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible, just right there, like the big moon, just it was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course. Number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. 
So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know, I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that. I'm like, ha, ah, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages up here at least. But in 2008 at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know, other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot, I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s, hair salons just had to have this machine. I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows. Physicians believed it had antiseptic 
properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. Okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. Not so British after all. If you're like me, then you're most likely not gonna be royalty. Although being a prince would be pretty cool, I just don't have the pure bloodline to be royalty, but neither does the Queen of England. When you think of old Blighty and her royal throne, you think of pure British descent, but you'd be wrong. The House of Windsor is actually Saxe Coburg Gotha, which, if you couldn't tell, doesn't exactly scream tea and crumpets. The German sounding name became an issue in the early 20th century due to the First World War breaking out against two time war loser Germany. Britain needing to inspire its citizens to defeat Germany, which at the time it was really anyone's game. So, to help inspire the people, King George V changed the name to Windsor. After all, it's kind of difficult to fight someone when you have more in common than differences. Not to mention that there were a lot of Germanic influences around, so really, it was a bad look and a great marketing decision. At number nine, Charles the Tampon? Yeah, we're getting weird. Relationships are kind of weird. I mean, they can be great, don't get me wrong, but they have a weird side too. Every couple is different and they have their thing. Some have a show that they like to watch together, others have their songs, and some have little sayings that they've come up with. But those are the more tame quirks that some couples have. Others, however, can get very bizarre, but many of them probably can't add up to the strange things that have been said between Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles. As we all know, Prince Charles was first married to Princess Diana, and it's no secret that they had a pretty tough relationship. Theirs was certainly not a happy marriage, and they each had their own affairs with other people while they were married. During their marriage, Charles was still pretty hung up on Camilla, the woman he was told he couldn't have, and who was also married to someone else. This minor obstacle, however, didn't stop them from getting freaky, at least over the phone. In 1992, the year that Charles and Diana announced their separation, a steamy phone conversation between Charles and Camilla was leaked, and it was super weird. In the call, Charles was simping like no other, saying things like how he wished he could live in Camilla's pants as a pair of panties, and even expressed his desire to be Camilla's tampon. Like what? Charles, stop it. Ew. This leak became a scandal called Tampon Gate, and as you can imagine, this wasn't good for the royals. But I guess it still kind of worked out for Charles, since after all that, he finally got the girl he wanted, and perhaps got to live out his dream of being a box of tampons or something. I don't know. I really don't want that mental image. Moving on. Number eight, Comrade Cousin? King George V and Tsar Nicholas II were rulers of vast empires in the early 20th century. You'd think the similarities between these two monarchs end there, but in reality, these two royal men were much closer than the public thought. Georgie and Nikki were first cousins. That's right, first cousins. Even though their respected empires were culturally different and separated by hundreds of miles, the two men were immediate family. Looking at images of the royals together doesn't require a DNA test to understand that they're related. They look identical and could easily be mistaken for twins. Unfortunately for Nicholas, when the Russian Revolution was in full swing, the Romanov family went into isolation after Nicholas abdicated his throne. While there, there were attempts to thwart the coup. Nikki's cousin wasn't the best aid. Just goes to show you that sometimes you can't rely on a guy who looks exactly like you because royalty has pretty messed up bloodlines. 
At number seven, killer date. What is the worst date that you've ever been on? What kinds of weird people have you met through your dating history? I'm sure there are some pretty wild and crazy stories out there, but I'm guessing that very few of them would even come close to the insane dating story from Princess Beatrice and how she literally dated a killer. In 2006, when Princess Beatrice was 17 years old, she got into a relationship with an American playboy named Paolo Luzo. Paolo was an arguably shady guy, judging by the fact that he was arrested on a manslaughter charge before getting with Beatrice. Paolo was accused of ending the life of 19 year old Jonathan Duchalier after beating the guy to death. Yeah. What a catch, right? Shockingly, Paolo's charges were reduced to a less severe charge, and he still got to date a princess after all of this. He even broke his probation to go on a trip to the French Alps with Princess Beatrice. How he finessed life so hard, I have no idea. But either way, their relationship only lasted a short amount of time. I can't say it's a good look for a member of the royal family to be seen with someone with such a dark past. Number six, the princess. The tragic loss of Princess Diana affected not only the UK but people around the globe. She was known for her courage and her willingness to help those in need, and had the nerve to speak her mind. Her shocking demise isn't met without controversy. In fact, it may be the biggest controversy of the royal family. There is some evidence that points in the direction that the royal family was behind her death. Diana had proclaimed to her guards that her car was having issues and even stated in a private letter to her butler that she had some reasonable fear that her life was in danger. In a nutshell, the royal family disapproved of the princess's new lover, even though Charles had clearly been up to no good himself. So in order for Charles to remarry and stop the gutter storm and the tabloids that Diana was going to create, they maybe sort of organized the accident that did end her life. Well, good thing that's over. and. After this, there won't be any more controversy for the family, right? Number five, the gong farmer. As cool as it would be to have your own castle with a drawbridge and a moat and a guy that stands in front looking all scary, sadly, moats often doubled down as toilets. They were just a big round ring of yuck. Very often, when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle, hanging over the moat, so that everything would just drop right down, right into that moat. Just a nice big, very loud plop somewhere outside. But another way they could deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse. Well, exactly like an outhouse. This was a outhouse, exactly. At one point, though, the cesspit would fill up, whoop, to the very top, so disgusting. And that's when our hero would enter the scene, the gong farmer. I pointed like there's one here, there really is. I wish there was, that would be amazing. The gong farmer, their job was to get in there, shovel all that yuck out, and then ferry it over to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The pits were often riddled with disease and of course poo and everything, and ideally they were quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well, these young fellas. But even then, lives were still lost. One man, very famous by the name of Richard the Raker, he fell into a cesspool and then he drowned. He drowned on the job. What a legend. He went out like a hero. You know what? Yeah, let's do that. Number four. Lot of rat. Imagine you're with your friends and family, you're gathering around a table in a medieval tavern, eating some bread, drinking some ale, not liking the flavor of either, or you're gathering around a candle, telling tall tales, and all of a sudden you feel a tickle around your feet. What could that be? It'd be a shame if it was a thousand rats, wouldn't it? It'd be a shame if it was a, a swarm of the plague around your feet while you're trying to eat dinner. That would suck, huh? That's exactly what it was. There were rats everywhere. Welcome to the dark ages. This one, ugh, too many rats. Mice? Maybe. Rats? Thumbs down for those. The plague rolled into medieval Europe back in 1328 and it lasted until 1350. That was a long time. It was actually really horrible. Don't get me wrong, our plague sucked. That was a lousy few years, no doubt about it. But they didn't have Ozark back then. Know what I mean? They had rats. How awful. During my time away during quarantine or whatever, I didn't see any swarms of rats. So let me know if you saw any down below. So far, I think we're progressing in the human race. The less rats, the better. That's what I like to see. I've said rats a thousand times. I'm gonna say it one more time. Rats, see ya. Number three. Quarantine. Our quarantine, again, looks a lot different during the medieval times. First of all, the average life expectancy back then in England was around 30 to 35 years old. I'm almost dead. I'm really almost reaching that point right now. With many people biting the bullet to poor nutrition, lack of sanitation, infectious diseases, living conditions, limited medical knowledge, being a witch, maybe you know some math, now you're a witch, gotta go, see ya, and frequent wars and famines, well, common illnesses included respiratory infections, dysentery, and tuberculosis. 
Jesus. A lot of shit, a lot of bad stuff back then. Medical treatments weren't great at the time. A lot of prayers, again, that's for sure. Dark Age medical treatments included herbal remedies, bloodletting, and surgical procedures performed without any anesthesia. So you felt every drop of every mistake that they were making above your body. However, there were also some advancements during this time, during these dark ages, including the founding of hospitals and the use of quarantine to prevent the spread of disease. Imagine being the first person to think of a quarantine. Hey you, go, just go away. I don't know, just go over there. Number two, plagues. The most well-known of these plagues is the Black Death, which first appeared in the mid 14th century and it wiped out an estimated 25 million people in Europe, or one third of the population, whichever sounds more horrible to you. Just go with that one. The Black Death was caused by the Yersinia pestis bacterium and it was spread by fleas that infested rats. And then rats would crawl around your feet and your toes while you're trying to eat lunch in a medieval tavern. That's how it spread so fast. That's how so many people bit the bullet. Another deadly outbreak during the medieval period was the Great Plague of Marseille in 1720, which killed approximately 100,000 people in France. Again, very fast. This outbreak was caused by the Yersinia pestis bacterium and spread by rats on boarding trading ships. So, didn't matter where you were. Rats were on ships coming towards you, so you were screwed wherever you lived. And finally, number one, superstition. In the medieval era, cats were often associated with witchcraft. Of course, you ever seen one of those guys? They're planning something with their little hands. The church, which held great power during the medieval period, they condemned cats as symbols of paganism and the devil, leading to widespread persecution of all the cats. Yeah, we're dying and also all the cats are too. Dark ages sucked. However, the rapid decline of cats led to a significant increase in the rodent population. Yeah, remember those fun fur balls that I mentioned a thousand times during this list? That's where this all started, this condemning of cats. This led to a surge in the number of rats and mice that carried every disease and then ran around Ratatouille style, just had fun all over the city. King Edgar the Peaceful, lovely name, love that. He reigned from 959 to 975. He issued a law in the 10th century that set a value on cats and imposed fines to anyone who harmed or killed them. Hashtag don't f with cats. The law was intended to encourage the breeding and keeping of cats as they were now seen as valuable for controlling the rodent population that threatened crops and food supplies. So basically, we hated rats, then we wanted them, then we got rid of them, now we want cats, now cats are the devil, and women are witches. That's the dark ages. That's pretty much all of it. Number 10 is a rocky time because toilet paper didn't migrate its way over to Europe until the 16th century. Before, it was all sponge sticks and rocks, baby, and stones were actually a pretty common bathroom solution for the average Greek, who used rounded pieces alongside ceramics known as pisoi, which translated to pebbles. They kept a pile of these pebbles in their lavatories in some cute little Bed Bath & Beyond brand wicker baskets for whenever it was time to freshen up. And similar to how we have the phrase, toilet paper doesn't grow on trees, they also had the saying to encourage a little frugality in the bathroom. Three stones are enough to wipe. But my favorite fun fact is some of these pisoi sometimes originated as ostraka, the pieces of broken ceramic on which the Greeks of old inscribed the names of enemies. The Ostraka were used to vote Big Brother style for some pain in the well, you know what, to be thrown out of town, hence ostracized. Check out the Bumblebee video Top 10 Historical Laws That Defy Logic to learn all about this strange law and phenomena, and maybe subscribe to our Hive while you're at it to stay up to date on all our video releases. This creative recycling of Ostraka as Pesoy allowed you to quite literally wipe your ass on the name and representation of someone you hate. However, the downside is that ancient Greek society had immensely high case of hemorrhoids, so you win and you lose. Number nine is red lit pale face, and I'd say she was breathing in snowflakes too, but there wasn't any of that in ancient Greece. At least I don't think so. While nowadays there's a massive culture of skin tanning and darkening, but in olden times, it was the opposite. It was pale, pale, pale. People wanted to look like chalk, loaves of wonder bread. The closer your complexion was to that of HP printer paper, the better. Even if it meant the Greeks would powder their entire bodies with lead to achieve it. Now that was around 200 BC, but thankfully by 1000 BC, they'd wisened up and realized rubbing poison over their entire body maybe wasn't the vibe. So instead they mixed it with chalk. Cause you know, diluted poison isn't as bad as the full thing. And then they smeared that everywhere. At least it was less deadly. After achieving the visage of freshly prepared mayonnaise, Grecian gals would then mix up some red iron deposit powder with fat or wax and rub that on her lips. And now ice that cake with mascara. Don't worry, it's only a mixture 
of egg whites, resin, and ammonia. You've now achieved the supernatural glam that doesn't make you look like the puppet from Saw at all. Number A is scrape it off. The ancient Greeks looked at bathing as aesthetic purposes first, actual hygiene second. Bathing wasn't to clean away dirt per se, rather to beautify the body. The Greeks did invent soap down the line, but prior to the advent of public baths in 600 BC, they started off using blocks of clay, sand, pumice, and ash that they'd rub away with olive oil after applying. The same oil that they'd then scrape off. This was done with a strigil. But that's okay. After 600 BC, you can always have a nice refreshing bath, right? Think again. Contrary to popular perception, not every city or village in ancient world had a public bath. Or even if it did, they weren't always open to everyone. Even when they were in fashion, if you were from a lower class, the best you could expect would be scrubbing yourself with old and pure olive oil that multiple people have already applied, scraped off, and returned to the same barrel for all poor people public use jug. If you were extra lucky, there would be a wash bowl. But then you'd be expected to share it, or even the water with someone else. Speaking of, number seven is sweat sales. So unlike the poor who scraped oil off into a container and reused it over and over until it eventually became sludge, or the rich who could use oil once and then just toss it out, athletes of Greece would scrape their oils off into special little containers. It's the same with their actual sweat to be sold. Sweat could easily be collected with a strigil the same as oils, and it would carry the dead skin cells and grime with it. This was called boy loss and the servants or athletes themselves would be expected to harvest it for people of Greece to do all sorts of weird things with it. These scrapings would then be sold as medicine, beauty products, perfume, you name it. People would rub the sweat of athletes on their skin, believing it to calm aches and pains, which it probably didn't do particularly well. If nothing else though, the Greek people, after rubbing some sweat and dirt on their skin, got to smell like an Olympian and enjoy some of the youthful vigor of the young men it came off of. At the same time, the gyms themselves would cash in on their youth users bodily fluids and would often scrape their walls and floors for extra good. Then invite companies to bid on the bottles of sweat. So the next time you're at the gym and you get off that machine and you leave that fresh layer of you do where your back used to be, wipe that crap off before someone harvests it and sells it like a freak. Number six is mystery creams. I only call them that because it's a mystery why they'd ever want to use these products as creams. I want to know who woke up one day and slapped some crocodile crap on their face. How did they figure out that this was a skincare thing. Someone had to be the first. I like to think that person fell in it, woke up the next day looking radiant, but whatever. Yeah, so crocodile dung was a big, big part of Grecian life because so were the animals, but it was far from being a nuisance. Vain folks saw this as an opportunity and the croc dung became part of many recipes for effective skincare treatment. This is face masks, contraceptive, hair masks, feet soaks. Hell, one recommendation for treating scars or crow's eyes around the eyes was by applying a little crocodile dung as eyeshadow. To quote a Greek medical document, levigate the dung of the land crocodile with water and anoint. If they have the means and the monies, people might even also have a whole dung bath in order to feel rejuvenated. I feel like that last one might have been a bit much, and considering the story of the ancient Greek philosopher Hercules, I am not far off in that opinion. Afflicted by swollen skin, he decided the best course of action would be some dung therapy. He buried himself in warm dung and mud in order to treat his condition, however, he stayed in the pile too long and ended up overheating and dying. Yeah, so number five is the highly debated blood baths. Oh, you thought Kim Kardashian invented the vampire facial? Girl, please. The culture vulture ain't got nothing on this. So, enter Elizabeth Bathory, who was either genuinely a menacing sociopathic killer or a pawn incriminated by family. If she was the first one, then you could definitely count her fave beauty hack as uncommon. So, Bathory is often proclaimed as the most prolific female killer of all time, accused of more than 600 plus young women's deaths inside her lavish castle. According to legend, she believed bathing in virginal blood would grant her eternal youth. And according to witnesses, if you want to believe a bunch of biased people after her money, Bathory's crimes took place between 1590 and 1610, with the most vicious happening after her husband's death in 1604. And it would take the blood of three maidens to fill Bathory's clawfoot porcelain tub. She would also use the blood as lip tint and rouge, and Bathory's alleged crimes have inspired films, plays, operas, television shows, and even video games. And you may be wondering, what is that exotic scent? Well, it's number four, dead cat musk. Henry VIII had some fun and fabulous hygiene habits. He invented groom of the stool, didn't bathe often, and when he did, it was in an old and aged version of a wooden jacuzzi tub, and he always had someone else wash his undercarriage. Sometimes while taking these baths to ease the pain in his sore leg, Henry soaked a mixture of herbs, musk, and civet. What is 
a vet? Well, the segment's name should probably imply it. It's a dead cat. It's a fancy kind of dead cat to be particular because it's small, wild, and carnivorous with a super distinct smell. I am not sure what cat musk smells like, but if it's anything like the smell of their spray, I am more than okay with not knowing. Like many people of his day, Henry also went to bed in a piece of fur so that fleas and lice would jump on it and not his royal skin. Which begs the question, wouldn't the fleas be confused if you smelled like a dead cat? Banned from drinking it, but love to bathe in it. Number three is Mary Queen of Wine. Get it? Cause she's usually called Mary Queen of Scots and Scots sounds like scotch. Went too far with it, that's okay. Anyways, so apparently Mary Queen of Scots wouldn't bathe in mere water, but in sweet white wine, as she believed it to be good for her complexion. She wouldn't touch a drop of the drink, being staunchly religious, but she still kept wine stores just to have poured in her bathtub, believing it to make her look pale and beautiful. Also, Mary equipped this as a form of pain relief. With venotherapy, including wine massages, facials, and baths remaining popular today, this shouldn't actually come as a surprise, especially because wine baths can be traced back to the time of Greece and Rome. There's even a very famous 16th century recipe called Afad Balafashia, which translates to to make a beautiful face. And it has a recipe to create a cosmic brew by boiling rosemary flowers with white wine. Quite a few people have tried it, as you can find the recipe online, and one tester group was called the Beautiful Chemistry Project, which studies its effects on skin quality and discovered that the process released essential oils and chemicals with antibacterial, moisture binding, collagen growth stimulating, anti-inflammatory, anti Antioxidant, brightening, and soothing effects. Number two is the stuff of nightmare. It's the permed wig. This really came as a shocker and is quite weird. So, when King Charles II had intercourse with ladies, he would collect some of their down their hair and then he would stitch it into a wig, which he donated to a club for rich nobles. I don't know, to like look at it. And then it was stolen from that club where someone starts another club where people came just to kiss the, the wig thing. Anyway, so King George IV was so inspired by this, he started doing the same. But unfortunately, he failed to complete his down there hair wig because he died before he finished collecting enough hair. Yeah, moving on. And last but not least, number one, ohagoro. So the Japanese custom of blackening one's teeth is an ancient practice, whether in the famous Genji Monogatari, a book from the 12th century that is considered the world's very first novel, or in various fairy and folk tales. The art of blackening one's teeth held a prominent place in Japan's history for some time. One of the main reasons for ohagoro is the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded with immense beauty. It's only natural that people want to get closer to what they deem as beautiful, just like the process of having one's teeth bleached to appear more white in modern times. So using a solution called Kenimizu, made out of ferric acetate from iron fillings mixed with vinegar and tannin from vegetables or tea, the custom was first used to celebrate someone's coming of age. Around the end of the Heian period, teeth blackening was done by adult aristocrats and nobles regardless of gender on a daily basis. By the time we hit the Edo period in 1603, teeth blackening is a sign of nobility and aristocracy is exclusively, especially amongst wealthy married women trying to mimic the allure of a geisha. Even now when walking the streets of Kyoto, Japan's old capital, it's not uncommon to meet a mako with pitch black teeth. As you might know, during the end of the Edo period and the beginning of the Meiji period, Japan was visited by western foreigners after almost 200 years of seclusion. Being used to western beauty standards, many visitors were shocked to see women with black teeth walking around. Some even thought that the Japanese people had terrible mouth hygiene, mistaking the dye for actual teeth tooth rot, and then others, having realized the blackening was on purpose, wondered why Japanese women would disfigure themselves. Okay. So Ohagoro was banned by the Meiji government in 1870 to appeal to western opinions, and the art of dyeing one's teeth was almost forgotten. Today it can be seen in theaters, movies, and the aforementioned Kyoto, where Geisha and Maiko still roam the street. Number 10. Spinning. Two words. Chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually because, no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. 
Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my God, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France, worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ah, ha, ha. Though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together. We still do it in like water parks. We swim in pools of pee pee and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, so great, you're like, why'd you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archeology span and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. Nice. Number five, bread and entertainment. Hygiene is health, and health is mental health. And that means after a long day, you need entertainment. That's why you came here, hopefully. They say that after bread comes entertainment. I feel the same. Where would my generation be if not for the ability to rewatch The Office infinitely? Aztecs had been theatrical killers, sure, but they also had a soft spot for the arts. During their crazy spring cleaning festival to save the world, you may just find the Aztecs enjoying music and poetry. Some of the poetry even survived the downfall of the Aztecs and is around today. I'd recite it, but I would need some help from Chris to help sound things out. I wonder if they had a poem for a stranger that comes from a faraway land to take all our golden riches away. Hmm. Number four, 
More than one way to skin a cat. Here I am talking about Aztecs, and that means I gotta talk about how bloodthirsty they were. Seriously, it's good they washed their hands because with the amount of blood on them, well, I don't have a joke for that. They just kind of got crazy with it. It's estimated that 20,000 people a year perish to sacrifice. That's that's way too many, dude. That's that's wrong. Which, if I'm being honest, those numbers probably could have helped you fight off the Spanish when they, they came to take everything. What do I know? Cutting the heart out of people while they were still alive, a lot of heads no longer attached to bodies, and something that's just so heinous. Texas Chainsaw fans rejoice because the Aztecs loved a good skinning. Just a good old fashioned peel skin off them. Just take it off, George. George, take your skin off. I don't know why Jerry Jerry Seinfeld skinning somebody, but sure. What do they do with the skins afterward? Do they throw them into the crowd and they cheer it on? Or, cause that's, that, that's just wrong, man. That's not right. That's wrong, bruv. The chief was so upset by this one that he had nothing to say, actually. The chief is speechless. He's got nothing. Number three, multiple wives. The act of doing the deed in the bedroom can be messy sometimes. It happens, a lot of passion. And keeping that area on your body and in your life clean is important. Or so says my sixth grade health teacher. I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. But you gotta think back in the day how sometimes keeping that area fresh was difficult, especially because we have no self-control and we went a little crazy with it. Take for example that having multiple wives was a status symbol. And let me tell you something, they weren't sitting around waiting for the new season of Stranger Things. They were doing as they do on the Discovery Channel. Number two, get your money right. Any good accountant will tell you that treating your portfolio like good hygiene is a good idea. Go for multiple smells or invest in multiple things. Check out what's on the market. Might be a new perfume, maybe a new stock. And while you're at it, dump a huge investment into fart bucks. Okay, well maybe not that accountant, but believe it or not, the Aztecs were great accountants and had good records of pretty much everything, which is unusual because most cultures in Mesoamerica just just didn't. And with the amount of gold and riches that the Aztecs had accumulated over time, it was kind of necessary. So you can understand that when the Spanish showed up, they were salivating at the sight of all the treasure that did not belong to them because Hernan Cortez was going to take it. Hand it over, you nice smelling weirdos. Number one, why doubt dude? Through everything the Aztecs went through or did, it all came down to a fever uh, and a cough and many other symptoms, actually. All of their triumphs and losses, all their sacrifices, and all the times they tried to fend off the Spanish. Futile compared to their fight against the sicknesses the Spanish had brought over. Once there was a patient zero, it was pretty much all over. As good as their roots and medical herbs were at healing, ain't nothing gonna cure that black lung. If it can do what it did to a big handsome cowboy, then it can do the same to everyday people. <laughs> Dutch, <laughs> we got the Aztec sick again, Dutch. <laughs> I got some chocolate though. Hope you like corn in your chocolate, Dutch. <laughs> Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it. That's actually it. Yeah, we like that. That's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job. 
a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angy. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious as you know that DEF CON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts, remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyeing their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, Crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again, who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. 
Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So depends really where I am, but kind of, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kind of, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room? from your secret lover. <laughs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? Well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, Lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops and eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's a no calzone, red flag. 
but yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful. For some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks in this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eye shadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. It seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients. Applicable powder and bugs. Yeah. You know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you can find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you know, just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Play said glazed serving away from the picnic and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You just stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem, no problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot, that one. You don't wanna be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints, actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day. You just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Could put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos. That wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. 
Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tofania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tofana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think? I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesborough Ponds bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box, a warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Kicking off the list at number 10, Koremlu. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Karemlu promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair, gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print, don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones, what is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. 
Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body what? Your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these. You can get blood clots, potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also, I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects, and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly, and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre, and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing, it was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups, so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure, that's all I'm saying. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, cause you know, you, you poop and then and gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough because in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guys hadn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. 
Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet and you're like, really? Really a thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't, simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black, yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick, is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible, that's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA your face, that's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Number 10, chamber pots. The chamber pot of secrets. Okay, this one's my favorite. The Middle Ages in Europe. This is a time where there were towering castles, these legendary pillars of architecture and defense. They're beautiful. God, I want a castle so bad. Well, there was one element that was a tad less glamorous. Not very much of a king thing here. Didn't see this in Game of Thrones, that's for sure. The chamber pot. Yes, it's so disgusting. Save yourself the long walk down that scary hallway and just piss in a box under your bed and kick it under. Perfect, we'll deal with that tomorrow morning. Proper sanitation facilities were non-existent. They were not a thing. Not too developed yet, so people resorted to using small containers, usually made of metal or ceramic, for their bodily fluids. Every fluid right there under your bed every night. Okay, so gross. These pots were kept in bedrooms under the bed or ideally hidden away and just, you know, tucked away forever. And then the next morning they were emptied either into a cesspit or, this is really the best one, tossed out of a window. Yeah, all of your pee and poo just tossed out of a window. The wet morning surprise usually arrived with a warning from above. So before tossing out your nightly bowl of yuck, you'd have to yell down below, garde loup. French line meaning watch out for the water. Me personally, I wouldn't say anything. I'd wait for my neighbor to go by. Close it up, we're good. Hate that neighbor, he's the worst. Number nine, 
dirty beds. So we've talked about storing chamber pots under your bed, but that's only if you were lucky enough to have a bed in the first place, all right? Not get ahead of ourselves, bougie medieval knight. If you were rich in the dark ages, having a bedroom was the talk of the town. You would have guests over to hang out in your bedroom. Weird flex, but I get it. When I was younger, I would rearrange my room and I'd be so proud. I'd call my family in and be like, look, look what I've done with my place. I have a desk now, I can do work. I don't have a job, I can work. Back then, you didn't have memory foam or a sleep number. Your mattress was made of straw. It sucked. You had to sleep in your clothes, the same tunic and cloak you've worn all day. Now you have to wear it all night and sleep. And otherwise you'll die. You'll probably freeze to death if you don't wear anything. You were never alone though. You were never alone. In that hay bed of yours, you had bugs, spiders, mice, all there to keep you company at night. Mm, how lovely, sweet dreams. Number eight. Dental exams. Oh, I haven't had one in a, in a while. I'm actually too afraid to look at this point. In medieval England, medical care was limited and often ineffective. It was bullshit. Never worked. Instead of having cavities, they thought that your mouth was riddled with worms crawling in and out of your teeth. Good old teeth worms. Knowledge was limited. Physicians were expensive and they mostly treated wealthy patients. While these peasants, us peasants over here, well, we got barber surgeons who performed basic surgeries and bloodletting. Bloodletting for some reason, of course. They were a barber slash dentist slash surgeon, so you already know it's gonna be a rough time. Herbal remedies and charms were commonly used and the church played a significant role in healing practices. Oh, please, I hope this root canal goes away. It hurts so much, please God. Aside from that, not much left. Hospitals were established to care for the sick, but conditions were often unsanitary and led to the spread of disease. Medical knowledge was, of course, very, very limited and many diseases and injuries were just untreatable. That's it, leading to high mortality rates altogether. Hit that thumbs up if you're gonna brush your teeth extra hard tonight, because I know I am. Don't want to get any teeth worms, do we? Number seven, cesspools. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms, right? Cesspools, where are we gonna put this one? It's rather important. They were often placed under the floors, which makes sense, because, you know, all that poop and gravity, not good. But you need to make sure that the floors above are also equally supportive. In 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, he had a dinner in the Palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through into that stinky cesspool right down below, just the middle of tea, huh? See ya. The situation was very real and very dangerous. I'm making light of it, but three people drowned. They met their fate face down in a cesspool. That is horrible. Worst way to go, hands down, face down. Poop down, everything's down, keep it all down. Number six, medieval manicures. I have one really sharp toenail right now. I gotta go fix that when I get home. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people like to do it on airplanes. It's always fun, they just get their foot up, clip the seven hour flight away. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the medieval day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look at the ancient Romans first and how they got rid of those hangnails. Well, they bit them off. That was the way I did it growing up, flexible lanky legs. I just bit all my problems away. That was the best way back then. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. So that's still a thing today. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was used for pulling hairs. Ah, so close. Medieval methods. This one was the best. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually a small little blade or around the Babylonian age, this newly invented scissor. How fun is that? Be really careful because it's the first ever pair of scissors and that's, uh, that's your baby toe, so good luck. Let it go, actually, just bite it, just let it grow. That's fine, don't even touch it. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well in the dark ages, which today is very helpful. I love filing down a sharp nail. I feel so fancy. Hit that thumbs up button. I'm gonna go file my nails down. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back, and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras and my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine you walk into a bathhouse after a long day and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas, I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. There's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. 
It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works Part Two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. Puberty induced body odor. Not to worry. Your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up the school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with the hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Starting with trick number 10, Queen Caroline, the clothed bather. So I'm not gonna lie, like 80% of this list is gonna be bath specific because for some reason, royals got really weird with that. When Caroline arrived in England as Princess of Wales in 1714, she amazed the court with her regular bathing habits. She liked her skin and gowns to be clean and her servants well manicured, a completely unheard of requirement in the time. What can I say, in the 17th century, bathing was controversial. There was two sides to the debate. One that said that bathing was healthy, and the other that argued it could damage your health, except in the most carefully prescribed circumstances. Now, her frequent bathing isn't subject of this section, per se, because we don't perceive that as uncommon today. The commentary is actually going to be how on Caroline would bathe with clothing on. Not like those big old elaborate ball gowns, but in a, like a boxy slip, yeah. Wet but fully clothed, she would have been dunked with warm water, rubbed with flannel cloths, and treated with soap solutions and cosmetic preparations like may do, or the milk of asses and mares, which is a lovely little segue into milk baths, number nine. You may think I'm about to spew off some Cleopatra facts and stories, which is fair. She and the Empress Papapea did make this treatment famous, but I'm talking about a different monarch and one funky decision she'd make it after the bath. So milk baths use lactic acid, a alpha hydroxy acid to dissolve the proteins which hold together dead skin cells. Whether or not the ancients knew all that, they could tell it had a rejuvenating effect on their skin. 
it. Whenever she was suffering from a distressing malady, which is olden terms for a woman being upset, Countess Platten Hanover bathed in milk and then generously donated the contaminated milk to the poor. Lives of Queen of England, The House of Hanover, Volume 1 by Dr. John Duran documented one such occasion, writing, Whenever Countess von Platten designed to appear with more ordinary brilliance than her own person, she was accustomed to indulge in an extravagant luxury of a milk bath. And it was added by the satirical or the scandalous that the milk which had just lent softness to her skin was charitably distributed amongst the poor of the district wherein she occasionally affected to play the character of Dorcas from the Bible. Now to answer the age old question, why toilets are called thrones is number 8. So French King Louis was downright gnarly. If he was alive now, the dude would probably be one of those people that's part of like that no shoes movement and refuses to wear deodorant and just terrorizes Walmart with how they smell. He famously made Versailles so bad, it smells to this day. And apparently he only bathed three times in his entire life, which should probably be punishable by death because I can't imagine someone who has literally never bathed not smelling offensive. Apparently he changes clothes three times a day and had a new perfume made every week to help, but this gross little weasel really went the full mile. He had a toilet seat under his throne and he would use it while addressing the court. Imagine dying of boredom during the king's mandate and all of a sudden he starts making faces and pausing in sentences and clinging to the throne arms trying to force out that day's dinner. Imagine accidentally making eye contact. I think I'm done with this segment now. And talking of unpleasant sights, Isabelline Brown is number 7 on the list. Victorian orsonologists, that's a fancy name for bird science people, are some of the only fun sciencey folks out there. They like to use obscure adjectives when naming newfound species, especially those that are a predominant color. As a result, there are species whose names include such words as Cercelene, which is sky blue, Cenarius, which is ashy, and Citrine, a light olive for some examples. But my favorite avian hue is Isabelline. Why? Because of its off-color origins, that's why. So prepare to ratch. Isabella and her husband, Albert IV, Archduke of Austria, were the southern of the Spanish Netherlands from 1598 to 1621. British folklore goes that in 1601, a Spanish army led by Albert laid siege to Ostend on behalf of her half-brother, King Philip III of Spain. Isabella apparently was feeling very, very confident in her husband's ability to win, so confident she vowed not to change her underwear until the city was taken. Unfortunately for Isabella and her entourage, her husband was not a great military tactician and the siege lasted until 1604, so three years. And for those three years, Isabella supposedly wore the same grubby underwear until they developed a range of unsavory coloration. Now if you're currently retching, I'm sorry, but I'm not letting up. Isabella, as a color description, was used before the siege in the year 1600, the inventory of Queen Elizabeth I's wardrobe. So if the color Isabella predates the siege of Austin, then the expression must come from an earlier Isabella. The French German, Italian, and Spanish languages all have versions of the word with a similar folk entomology, except that in all cases, the reference is to the eight month siege of Granada by Isabella I of Castile and her husband Ferdinand II of Aragon. So, if any royal Isabella did give their underoos the world's worst tie dye job, then, well, it seems likely it was Isabella of Castile. So, let's talk about Isabella of Castile for number six and her bathing ban, shall we? So, Philip II, Isabella's father, banned and bathhouses in 1576. So apparently it's in the genetics to be downright filthy. This may sound crazy, but in Spain, the Christian doctrine saw bathing as a corrupt practice that could only lead to nakedness. Apparently being a human in your most natural form was considered hedonism and something unreligious. God forbid if you splash some water on you too. So this belief was to such a wild extent, Christians often walked from England or France to Jerusalem as a ritual without washing or changing their clothes. After the conquest of Granada by the Christians, the Muslims of Spain not only had to give up their religion to survive the Inquisition, but they also had to give up bathing. Isabella and Ferdinand ordered the Muslim baths to be destroyed and informed them that bathing was strictly forbidden. Isabella boasted that she herself, their leader, had only bathed twice in her life, and pretty much every historian takes her word for it. Makes sense that she would be so grimy they can name a questionable shade of brown after her underwear. Naturally, the Muslim people are absolutely horrified because cleanliness is literally mandatory 
in their religion as the prerequisite for every form and mode of worship. And by extension, it had become culturally significant. To separate them from their religion and then ban their last remaining tie to it, that's dirtier than Isabella's briefs. Even when Columbus mentioned the daily bathing habits of the indigenous peoples of Bahamas and the Caribbean, Isabella was horrified to the point of rage and commanded them too as her new subjects to stop this blasphemous bathing practice at once. Number 5. What? Well, I didn't have any corn? Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really, it's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that and you're just like, oh, what? It, it walked up that out of my mouth. That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the suns of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, curse craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River. Almost like people rely on water or something. And take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung. And people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes. And to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you got souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. I, oh God, that just, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake. Ooh. Number 10, the forbidden toothpaste. If I looked into your bathroom right now, what would I see? Oh, uh, you forgot to flush the toilet. If it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. 
Seems you've forgotten your own golden rule there. What I was actually looking at was for a flavor of toothpaste that you had. Classic mint, maybe you got cinnamon. Maybe you go for the whole bamboo toothbrush charcoal toothpaste vibe. Hey, I respect it, good on you for making better choices. But bad on the Aztecs for making gross choices. Ever look at some forbidden lemonade and think, hey, add some salt to this. And now we got ourselves a bona fide toothpaste? Of course you didn't, because you ain't a crazy person. Or at least I hope you're not. But yeah, Aztecs used to brush their teeth with an unholy mixture of golden broth, pee, and salt. Yeah, I. why would you add salt to pee? I, I think it cleans teeth, sure. You just have to borrow an Egyptian breathman after. It's no big deal, it's fine. It's good for your teeth, it's fine. Number nine, high stakes. Any good game of a sport will have you at the edge of your seat and dropping all cheese flavored snacks around you just so you can keep your eyes glued to the screen. The Aztecs did not have access to such finger licking good things like Doritos, but what they did have was a sport that was very high stakes, maybe too high actually, as if you didn't win, it could very well cost you your life. A game called, here we go, Chris is gonna like me pronouncing this, called Omalazitli. With its nine pound rubber ball and eye shaped court, players had to pass the ball through a small stone ring. This game was taken very seriously, like ritual serious, and you didn't want to be on the losing side, as it may cost you your head. Yes, even sports events in modern times have gotten violent, sure. But if we started lopping off heads for our losses, well, Tom Brady would have a lot more blood on his hands, wouldn't he? Number eight, hot chocolate. As a Canadian, I cannot tell you how important the medicinal qualities that are a hot chocolate on a wet, cold winter's day. You've been slipping and sliding down a snow hill for hours, and your snow pants are soaking wet, partially from the snow and also because your dad made you go down the super scary hill and it was too much for you. Don't tell mom. Hot chocolate was important for the Aztecs too, more so just chocolate actually. It was used for a number of things. First off, after the beans have been roasted, they smell amazing, so it most likely went into some perfumes and other lovely smelling things that they used. It was also used as currency, strangely enough, and it was also, 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 used as a ritual drink, except they didn't exactly have sugar, so they used other things, other ingredients like peppers and other unusual flavor enhancers. To, for chocolate, I don't, pepper, I, I never understood that. People are like, it's hot, like Mexican hot chocolate, it's, it's pepper and chocolate. It's a weird, hot, cho hot spicy chocolate, not a, not a fan, not a fan. Number seven, corn goddess. I like corn just as much as the next guy. Roasted, boiled, and on the cob. Slap some salted butter on that bad boy, Whew, it's time to dig in. Make sure you got the corn on the cob holders though. The little metal thing is that you'll probably end up stabbing yourself with later, that's just, that's just how it goes. Besides backyard summer barbecues, corn was an important staple of the Aztecs. So important that they had a festival to honor the corn goddess. Which to me is kind of a lame thing to be a god of, but alright, let's run with it. Zilonan festival had the women let their hair loose and green corn placed in it to honor the god, the corn god. A forced female volunteer was dressed as the goddess and after many days of what I'm assuming is eating and worshiping corn, the forced volunteer was sacrificed by the people to once again honor the corn god. You'd think a bowl of corn would do the job, but no, nope, she's got a lust for blood, so that means uh, off with the head. Number six, end times. We all know what ancient civilizations are like with predicting the future, or more specifically, predicting the end times. Mayans thought everything was going to fade to black in 2012. Didn't, did it. Some people really thought this was going to happen. I always thought that Buddy just didn't get around to finishing the thing, but hey, whatever works. Well, if it was real, why didn't the world end? Well, the Aztec answer to that was the new fire ceremony. Another ceremony, why not? Basically, every once in a while, things got a little crazy. It was a time to cleanse, a spring cleaning, if you will. People stopped working, destroyed household items, and at the end of a five day cycle, some priests would take a dude up a volcano and toss him in there like I toss away bad report cards from my mother. All this to prevent the end of the world. Virus, act of God, bad hygiene. Whatever it was, just good old fashioned blanket solution. <laughs> Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again, I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then, you know, put, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass, 
or moss. Sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four, Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. It's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. They just called it Sweet Rays. Maybe they gave it up to the baby, I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce. And I just thought of that sauce. Baby Rays, Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-tips were dipped in boric acid and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like, <laughs> my eyes roll back every time. I get so, I get way too deep. I get too deep where I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams. It's like Apple, like I, iPad, I, phone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears? What's that about? Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore. Just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero, gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure. Thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath & Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled as a poison. Yeah, <laughs> sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed shit going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them, on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually, Tiofana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiofana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Seranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. <clears throat> yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it?